Uh, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to DLSC for this online event. My name is Francesco Caselli, and I'm a professor in the LSE's Department of Economics. Tonight's event is the annual Phillips Lecture, and it is jointly hosted by Economica and the Economics Department. Economica is the flagship economic journal of the LSE, and the Phillips Lecture is named after the author of one of the most important papers in macroeconomics ever published in economics in Economica, or indeed ever published. Um, each annual Phillips Lecture is later published in the journal, and I encourage you to visit the journal's webpage to read some fabulous work by the previous speakers. The previous speakers so far have included Robert Lucas, Thomas Sargent, Robert Barrow, Christopher Pisarides, Robert Hall, and uh, Christina Romer. I am very pleased to welcome this year's speaker, Professor Carmen Reinhardt. Uh, Carmen is the uh, Minos Dombanakis Professor of the International Financial System at Harvard Kennedy School. Carmen is simply a superstar in the international economics field. Uh, she has made fundamental contributions on many topics, uh, perhaps among many outside fiscal policy and international capital flows, uh, but there are many others. Uh, she also has had a very uh, glittering career outside of academia, where she has served in critical public policy positions in major international and national uh, organizations, as well as having a very successful private sector career. Uh, Carmen has won many prizes and awards and recognitions. Uh, I can't uh, list them all. I will just maybe mention the recent award of the Juan Carlos Prize for the absolute distinction of her career in economics. And last but not least, I'm sure uh, most of those who are listening uh, know that last week she has been announced as the new chief economist of the World Bank, uh, an appointment for which I am very pleased to heartily congratulate her. And I guess also wish her good luck um, at, as she takes this job. Uh, Carmen's lecture is titled Capital Flow Cycles, a long global view. Or, um, and um, just before I give her the screen, I guess, uh, a couple of uh, uh, homekeeping uh, points. Uh, those who are using Twitter, uh, the hashtag for today's event is hashtag LSE Economica. And also be aware that the event is being recorded and will be hopefully made available as a podcast uh, subject to no technical difficulties. Um, now, as usual, we want to have a chance for Q&A. &E, Q um, there is a Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. Uh, what will happen is that if you submit questions there, they will then be passed on to me and they will pose as many as I can uh, to the speaker. When you pose question, let us know your name and affiliation. Um, and of course, we are particularly keen to hear from our students, our alumni and incoming students. But of course, everybody is invited to uh, submit questions. And now, Carmen, I'm very happy to uh, hand over to you. Uh, thank you, Francesco. Um, um, Can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Hello? C can you hear me? Yes, very good. good. Okay, very good. Um, thank you for, uh, for inviting me to this lecture. I was supposed to have delivered this in person in, in March. Uh, unfortunately, uh, that was uh, uh, overtaken by events. So um, what I'd like to do is launch right in. This is an area, as you mentioned, I've been working uh, on issues relating to capital flows uh, for many years. And some of this work revisits that early work. Uh, and uh, uh, let me go to it. And um, the, um, 
excuse me. Uh, sorry. Um, so what I'd like to do is divide the presentation into four parts. And the first part is really very brief. It it's, gives you a little flavor of this long ongoing project that I've had with uh, Vincent Reinhardt and Christoph Trebisch in which we like to take a, a long global view as the title suggests of capital flow cycles and um, connect in the long uh, literature of the last 20 years, uh, global, the, the, the cycle in global capital flows to global factors. And I think we're living through a period where the role of global factors is very much in the forefront of everyone's mind. But in this long historical project, uh, we look at uh, factors that we will revisit in the context later on of what's going on today. Uh, so we start out by presenting the big picture on capital flows and the very related issue of globalization, financial globalization. Um, financial globalization actually goes through cycles itself, very long cycles, if you will. And we, we may be at a turning point uh, in another one uh, of those cycles. Um, I'm going to move on after talking a little bit about what we do with regards commodity prices, uh, uh, global financial centers, defaults, and so on, and the role all these global factors playing shaping uh, cross-border flows. I'm going to try to synthesize. I'm going to leave a lot of, there's a lot of richness of work in terms of how central bank, bank policy has evolved. Uh, a lot more nuances also on specific as of other financial variables that affect uh, in financial centers that affect capital flows, different ways of measuring capital mobility. I'm going to nuance from some of that and just try to focus on the big picture, uh, the big takeaways uh, on the main uh, global factors. And then the very last part of my presentation is, okay, we've looked at this big historic uh, panoramic picture. Uh, are there episodes? Are there strands uh, of the results that help us connect uh, and understand what we're seeing in global capital markets now. So that is my, uh, excuse me, my uh, planned agenda. Um, let me start uh, by saying a little bit uh, about the database. Um, it's a very hybrid database because anytime that you uh, are trying to do very long histories, uh, you work with what you have. So what you will see is that the earlier, the 19th century from 1815 to 1914, our measure of uh, capital flows is a gross measure. Uh, it is primarily centered on uh, fixed income. So it is based on bond issuance uh, and it is based on uh, the UK uh, fine, as a financial center, the, the, the largest financial center uh, at the time. So one could enrich this analysis in many ways. Um, uh, my friend and colleague, Graciela Kaminsky, focusing on uh, a narrower set of seven Latin American countries has also looked at corporate bond flows in the latter part of the 19th century, uh, you could uh, look at, at sub-sovereigns and so on. There's a lot of richness that, that one could add to this. Um, but again, I, I, we view this as a, a, a work in progress. This is, this is a database in progress. The latter part of the sample from World War I onwards, we focus on net flows and we are currently building 
uh, a, a database uh, on gross flows uh, as well. We construct um, the capital flow data for, by the way, for many countries in our sample, we intend to put this out, uh, you know, this database out with a chart book an individual country chart book. For many of the countries, we actually have net flows well before 1918 uh, in the latter part of the, the 19th century. So it's a lot more than what you see here. Uh, but we build basically the capital flow uh, measure, the net flow measure from the uh, accounting, the BOP accounting identity, looking at current account deficits and changes in central bank uh, foreign exchange reserves. Um, the data work also includes uh, a new measure, which we will be writing actually a short box EU on this, but a, a measure of the VIX. In the last 20 years, I would say the data, uh, the uh, literature on push versus pull factors uh, in, in global capital, the work of, of uh, uh, Kristen Forbes, Frank Warnock, Helen Ray, uh, Stein Klassens, among others, uh, um, has stressed also the role of the VIX. So we have also constructed a VIX proxy, which you will see. We have an annual series going back to 1815 and a monthly one starting in 1885. Um, we uh, also since the key financial center of the 19th century was the UK, we thought it was actually quite interesting that a key driver of capital flow cycles in that century was connected to the UK debt conversions, which basically uh, took uh, existing um, long bonds and converted them uh, usually with a profile and with the aim of reducing uh, debt servicing costs, these bonds were all callable. And so this, this is a conversion risk that the investors were privy to, uh, but it resulted in very sh sharp ladder-like uh, declines in long rates, which were a major catalyst. Um, I, in the interest of moving on, I would like to uh, just highlight that, as I said, we are in the process of uh, adding or trying to uh, achieve greater continuity uh, with measures of gross flows uh, for the post-World War I era. And so here's, here's the... Uh, um, chronology of, of the big picture items I'm gonna focus on. I'm gonna obviously start with capital flows and continue on to, in that big picture, just describing the big stylized facts and talk about the latest uh, capital flow cycle and how it differs. I'm not talking about COVID time capital flows, but just the latest big cycle pre-COVID uh, before we get into that and the role of China and the surge in official lending and official capital flows in the last 20 uh, years or so. So here's the picture of the uh, cycles. And there is one component of it that I would like to uh, highlight. Uh, it's extremely volatile. Uh, and I will flag a couple of episodes of historic interest because I think they're also relevant to understanding what is happening today. Two of those factors, none of them, by the way, of these factors had to do with pandemics. So, you know, that's, let's leave that aside, but they have a great deal to do with risk aversion, with fear of defaults, uh, with commodity price collapses, which I will expound on later. But the first uh, crash in uh, global capital flows uh, came in the mid 1920s. And this was the first, if you will, emerging market crisis. 
uh, which encompassed most of Latin America that was independent at the time, but also countries like Greece and Portugal that were borrowing uh, in international capital markets, among others like Russia and so on. Um, then uh, that's one episode that is worth looking at in the current context, but more pointedly, an episode that I will later on talk about is the interwar period during the Great Depression in which you had a boom or a big spike as this chart highlights in uh, bond issuance, which translated into large net inflows uh, by many countries. The issuance at this time was concentrated in New York. Um, and so the US in the 1920s after World War I was a major capital exporter. And then after the 29 crash, that capital was you know, flowed back to the US and it created the biggest sudden stop uh, that we have in this sample. Although the sudden stop from the first episode of the 1820s was also a significant magnitude, something I'm gonna come back to uh, later. Um, in terms of capital flow cycles, this is only one measure. This is really the incidence. So it's not dominated by a couple of very large countries that issue a lot of bonds or that borrow a lot. We also look at the global incidence. In this latter part here, we're actually understating uh, in the last 20 years, the breadth of coverage of our sample because we have not included uh, in this core sample um, our, our broader uh, measure post 1980, which uh, encompasses uh, uh, 160 uh, some countries and shows you know, a much higher degree of global participation. When people also talk about the rise of globalization and the fall of globalization, a picture like this is very often what they have in mind with the rise in international financial integration and globalization peaking around World War I taking a big hit at the time of World War I, coming back in the 20s, and then the depression is another big hit to globalization. And World War II uh, ends that globalization cycle abruptly, uh, and we settle into the uh, post-war Bretton Woods of very low capital mobility, capital controls, uh, much more limited uh, global integration. And the question is, are we repeating that cycle now? But that's not the topic for this very moment. Um, highlighting that, highlighting the theme that there is a global capital flow cycle, albeit, as I will highlight, there are perils of aggregation. Post-World War II, the emerging market cycle differs markedly from the advanced economy cycle, not that much, pre-World War II. Uh, but the point being also that in support of there being a uh, global capital flow cycle, uh, there's a lot of evidence of, of co-movement. I would make the big caveat that it is time varying. There are periods in which either de jure or de facto capital mobility and therefore capital flows are very low, very limited. And what do I mean before going on by de facto versus de jure? Uh, de facto, I mean eras of capital controls like the interwar years or early Bretton Woods. Uh, that's, that's the, I'm sorry, that's de jure uh, when there are capital control measures. De facto refers to the fact that uh, many countries, when they default, have debt, sovereign debt crisis, lose capital market access uh, with or without capital control. So global capital mobility also takes a hit as the global incidence of default increases. But these, uh, the takeaway from this slide and the next slide, uh, which the first slide looks at uh, capital flows as constructed from its components, current account and reserves for the 
post-World War I era and pre-World War I, as I mentioned earlier, it is based on uh, bond issuance in global capital markets. Um, there's quite a bit of, of uh, co-movement. Uh, again, supporting the view that um, we're going to investigate further, which is uh, global factors, push factors. This is an old theme from Calvo Laterman Reinhardt in the early 1990s, global push factors matter a great deal uh, when in understanding cross-border flows. So let me turn to uh, an area that uh, Reinhardt, Reinhardt and Trebish have been focusing on, which uh, I think rece receives, has received short shrift in the literature, the academic literature of capital flows, and that is the global commodity cycle. Um, real non-oil commodity prices and also oil. We've done, as I said, I'm really summarizing what is a much, you know, broader uh, kind of analysis. Um, uh, but focusing on the non-oil commodity prices, booms and busts in commodity prices uh, are in most of the sample a big driver of capital flows. I will elaborate what most means and for and important for whom. Uh, this um, I think is very critical because we tend to, and again, I, I am very much part of that uh, view that I think may be focused much more on the financial center variables like the role of international interest rates. Uh, but commodity prices are the bread and butter of, uh, commodity exports are the bread and butter of many countries. Uh, they are often the dominant source of foreign exchange. Uh, and when commodity prices plummet, put simply, uh, uh, current account deficits worsen, you would say, aha, that means that capital flows should increase, right? Because the current account is, is worsening. Uh, but unfortunately also what we, and we uh, elaborate on this is uh, during uh, commodity bus reserves also, central bank reserves also fall often dramatically and uh, commodity bus on the whole uh, are associated with capital outflows, uh, despite their uh, negative effects on, on uh, making the current account actually worse. Um, one important driver, and this is something for, I hope the listeners to put in store when we're discussing later the uh, effects of COVID on global capital markets. Um, if you look at the last 20 years, a major driver uh, of commodity prices has been the growth rate in China. These are simple. What I'm going to present throughout, just methodologically, I'm not going to give you a model of, of, of capital flows. Uh, I think that model is likely to be time bearing, depending, you know, given that we're covering uh, uh, over 200 years. Uh, importantly, what I'm going to do is characterize the facts with standard deviations, I mean, with um, uh, uh, simple pairwise correlations and their uh, standard errors to, to you know, uh, assess relationships at this stage. And one that really jumps out at you, and this is not entirely surprising, uh, Rudy Dornbush in the 1980s uh, had a couple, you know, had a number of papers, one in Brookings on uh, demand, the demand driven story of, or the demand driven story of com global commodity prices. At that time, the, the, big, the big driver was the US economy. Uh, in the last 20 years, importantly, uh, China, uh, China's growth rates and its ups and downs in that growth rate uh, have correlated significantly with uh, commodity prices. 
let me move on. This is sort of another classic uh, uh, global push factor, which is uh, uh, short-term rates. This is a policy rate here shown, but we, we look at a whole family of interest rates. We look at commercial paper rates. We look at treasury, short-term treasuries. We look at long bonds, uh, but this is the, the policy rate here. One big takeaway, and which is why while the overarching message of this work, of this body of work, is that global ma factors matter and they matter a lot, they're not etched in stone. And which ones matter a lot depends uh, significantly on what subperiod you're looking in. In a nutshell, if you were to look at the first half of the 19th century, what you see are real rates that look like a seesaw. You see that, you see that right here. And this is because inflation was extremely volatile, completely unlike today. You had deflation of 10% one year and inflation of 15% another, extremely volatile. And actually, if you look at capital flows during that era, long bonds, nominal long bonds are the uh, key driver rather than short real rates. Uh, so again, what, but I'm getting a little ahead of myself. I, I, I will go back to that. Here is the other global factor, financial factor that has been emphasized in the capital flow literature, as I mentioned earlier. Um, this is the high frequency VIX that uh, we constructed. As I said, look in the next couple of weeks for a short box EU piece describing the construction of this index. Uh, and we have an even longer series for the UK market and for the US market beginning in 1800. Uh, that's, you know, uh, but, but the most granular one is the one I've shown here. I've, I'm also showing the CBOE uh, VIX. Uh, correlation between the two is, is, is almost 0.9. Uh, but importantly, and store this please for when we discuss the ongoing, the unfolding crisis. Store this. Um, what this chart shows is the top, I mean, it shows the, the, the two series, but it looks also at what observations are in the top one percentile readings of the uh, VIX. And the major uh, takeaway uh, is that apart from what we already would expect a priori, which is and indeed not expect, but we actually saw, you know, that yes, it spiked dramatically uh, during the 2008 2009 global financial crisis. Yes, it spiked uh, in October of 87. Uh, Black Monday, uh, it, the, the most significant spike of all in the post-war in, in this volatility index is the March 2020 reading for the VIX proxy. But interestingly, what I'd like to highlight, which we didn't know, is that if you uh, look at the history of this index, the high volatility readings, the top one percent are, are importantly clustered around the capital, major capital flow reversal. Remember that first chart I showed, I said, I'm gonna focus on the interwar and this huge sudden stop, this big reversal. Uh, that's also around the time in which the VIX has repeated spikes as this little table that you see uh, in their highlights. The other element that other studies have not brought into focus, neither on the historical uh, dimension or, or the more modern one, uh, is the nexus between um, uh, the incidence of default and global capital flows. And th the story is straightforward. If you're in default, um, and, and by the way, two points. One is if you're in default, uh, capital flows, capital inflows tend to dry up. That's a fairly obvious uh, statement, but one that we see again and again. That's 
pretty straightforward. The other part, which is less obvious, is that if we look, if we aggregate, let's say we take either all countries or all emerging markets or all countries within a region, whichever level of aggregation, the higher the number of countries in default, possibly a priori, the lower the sensitivity of overall flows to international interest rates. Why? Because for many countries that are in default, it doesn't matter if international interest rates go up or international interest rates go down, they have no access to capital markets. So the issue of incorporating defaults uh, is, uh, it's a very important one when uh, looking, especially as I, we will highlight when looking at capital flows uh, in uh, uh, two emerging markets. Um, in the context of this chart, uh, uh, Christoph Vincent and I have for some time speculated on what we call the curious case of the missing defaults. Um, and what do we mean by the curious case of missing defaults uh, is if you look at um, prior spikes in new defaults as shown in this graph, um, commodity uh, uh, busts, significant declines in commodity prices and capital flow reversals jointly usually have produced a spike or have been associated with hardship in debt repayment and uh, produced a spike in uh, sovereign defaults. We, you know, it's, it's been a while since we've seen such a spike. And so we began to uh, see what was behind this. Uh, we'd like to highlight that, you know, uh, in this cycle, Yes, we've seen capital flow reversals even before COVID, okay? Even before COVID, the e emerging markets have seen quite a bit post 2013, beginning with a taper tantrum, have seen quite a bit of capital flow reversals and volatility. We've had capital flow busts, we've had commodity busts, but we have not had a, a, a spike in international interest rates. Uh, that is one possible explanation for the low incidence of defaults. So there is maybe the low defaults or the curious case of missing defaults is because rates have remained low. Another possible explanation, these are not mutually exclusive, is that um, uh, the um, uh, countries themselves adopted better capital flow management measures that have made them less vulnerable to capital flow reversals. The third possibility is we're mismeasuring defaults. And uh, this is a point that Christoph Trebisch, Sebastian Horn and I make in some recent work on capital flows from China, uh, lending from China uh, to emerging markets, especially the middle to low income countries has uh, soared in, in recent past and, and uh, China's overseas loans in their totality are about 6% of global GDP. Uh, after all this lending, there's also been a lot of debt restructurings, but a key element of China's bilateral lending to a lot of countries is that it's extremely opaque. I'm not going to get into that here because that's a separate, you know, line of research, but it's very opaque. We've tried to quantify it. We've produced estimates of both flows and stocks of this official Chinese lending to many countries. And we've also collected data on debt restructurings, which is the red line that you see there. Bottom line is part of the story of the missing defaults. Uh, are defaults that simply are not being picked up by Standard & Poor's or Moody's uh, or Fitch because they are defaults 
on a bilateral official creditor. And China is also not part of the Paris Club. So these uh, missing defaults, uh, you know, have, have largely gone off the radar screen. So uh, turning to the second uh, part, which I've laid the groundwork uh, with the major building blocks. Uh, so the second part should go fairly quickly because I've introduced all the major, uh, you know, the major uh, variables of interest and, and discussed some of the uh, eras already. But I'll give you a brief takeaway of when we look at the 19th century, the uh, interwar, and then the post-war era divided into roughly Bretton Woods and the modern era. What are some of the main takeaways? And I'm gonna spend a little time on this and then go quickly just to give you the, how the, the empirics fit into the, some of these statements. As I mentioned earlier, I'm not gonna belabor this. It would be repetitive to say, but you know, we, we see evidence of uh, co-movement across countries. Uh, there, if, whether you look at the incidence uh, or share of countries accessing capital markets, or whether you look at the magnitudes, whether it's weighted or unweighted, uh, you see evidence of a global cycle. I would note, however, that post-World War II, uh, the, there is a more marked divergence between the emerging market, EM, uh, cycle and the advanced economy, AE cycle. I would note that many of today's advanced economies uh, were also defaulting right, left, and center in the uh, previous century. And so the distinction between what was an emerging market and an advanced economy was somewhat more nebulous uh, than it is today. Second big point is there is a systematic relationship, a correlation as one would expect between the commodity cycle and the capital flow cycle. However, it's, uh, it's, it's not uniform. The, in the modern era, in the modern era, that correlation is strongest for emerging markets. Not surprisingly, that's where a lot of the bigger Although you know we have Australia, we have New Zealand, we have Canada, but you know the commodity cluster uh, is greatest for emerging markets. Um, but commodities are noisy, so this is sort of like the statement that you know the equity market has predicted. You know, six out of the last four recessions. This is what you have also in in, in when you look at commodity cycles are more frequent than capital flow cycles. Um, Interest rates in financial centers are significant, uh, but again, which ones depends on the, the, the time frame. In the 19th century, long bonds are the dominant. Uh, short rates, policy rates are, you know, all over the place. It's in the modern era uh, of greater interest. If I told you that for many emerging markets, because we've also done you know, subgroups for many emerging markets, a lowering of interest rates uh, in the center country would lead to capital outflows from emerging markets. You would tell me, Carmen, that, doesn't, that sounds really wrong. It actually isn't when you look at the breakdown. Um, when, in, when U.S. interest rates rise in the modern context, what you often see are capital inflows, you know, or, or emerging markets become more attractive, which also leads, and this is important, this, I'm not going to belabor this because it would sidetrack us, but what we see is a lot of leaning against the wind by central banks. So central banks accumulate reserves. When international interest rates are more favorable, they accumulate reserves. When interest rates go up, they lose reserves. This is reserve accumulation is an official capital outflow. So the issue of banks leaning against the wind has a great deal to say about 
the relationship between uh, short-term international interest rates and uh, capital flows. There are perils of aggregation. Lastly and quickly, uh, both the VIX and the share of new defaults uh, are, are negative and significantly correlated. In the case of the VIX, it's a post-World War I phenomenon. We really don't find any systematic, and we you know, looked at various possibilities, but we don't really find a role for the VIX in the 19th century. But it's not a modern, modern thing either. It's the relationship is there even in the interwar and it's particularly strong in the interwar. Global share of defaults are also uh, uh, a key driver and this goes back to the 19th century. So it, not in the very early part of the 19th century but from 1870 onwards, um, the share of global new defaults affects all capital flows. And since World War II, uh, it affects uh, EM flows. That's a recap. I'm going to show you slides fairly quickly. Uh, I think Francesco is going to post the slide so you have go, you can go back and connect to the different examples. But the stories we tell today are old stories. You know, the first search for yield was, you know, uh, dates back to the 1820s. Uh, when the Bank of England, after the Napoleonic Wars, reduced interest rates, um, they had a debt conversion, which not only they not only did the Bank of England reduce short rates, but more importantly, the debt conversion significantly lowered bond yields uh, in the UK, uh, and so capital uh, searched for higher yields abroad. Uh, like so many episodes, it ended badly. Uh, we saw, you know, most of these countries that had a spike in issuance, this is what you see here, uh, ending up in default uh, not long thereafter. Um, this is, again, I'm going to go quickly, and you can, at, at your leisure, go back if you're interested in this uh, to substantiate some of the points I make. Um, this is the uh, path of long rates uh, in the UK uh, through uh, much of the 19th century. As long rates came down, the push to search for higher yields abroad fueled the globalization of capital markets during what became later known as the golden era of the gold standard. Um, these are in, in every table that I showed, anything that is colored are the significant uh, correlations. The darker the color, uh, the, the tighter, you know, so the from pale to dark, it's 10%, 5%, and 1% level of significance. Um, the big takeaway, as I said, is uh, long bonds matter, the path of rates, owing to the debt conversion matters, uh, the share of new defaults uh, matter. I want to move quickly into the interwar because I want to uh, wrap up with moving to the, uh, the current situation. Um, uh, the interwar is particularly interesting because uh, we had, after World War I, where all capital flows, you know, you, everybody had capital controls uh, during the war. Uh, you had a new wave of issuance. The UK finan uh, London Financial Center did not fully recover. The activity transferred to New York and there were massive, massive bond issuance in New York. The US became very quickly a very significant international lender. After the crash of 29, that was the sudden stop of sudden stops, and the U.S. became a capital uh, importer. Uh, as capital dries up uh, at a time in which there are also crashing uh, global commodity prices and spiking real interest rates because of deflation, uh, the incidence of new defaults, and you see this, the share of new defaults spikes 
I'm going to refer to this chart. So store this chart in your memory. I'm going to refer to it when I talk about the modern era. Big drivers of capital flows uh, during this time um, are new defaults and the VIGs. Um, so uh, again, this is an era where risk aversion and volatility uh, in the 30s is, is, is that, and of course the risk of new defaults are the dominant uh, drivers. Post-war, I'll give you a synopsis with two takeaways, which so rather than repeat myself, I'll just you know, highlight that we make two points. Uh, one is embellishing on the earlier point that global factors matter a lot, but how they matter and which ones vary a lot. And we flag what we call the perils of aggregation in the post-war era. And number one peril is aggregating advanced economies and emerging markets. Their reaction to interest rates, commodity prices, uh, defaults, the VIX are very different. Second level of aggregation, perils of aggregation is when you look especially at emerging markets, less so advanced economies, please look at the bottom, uh, you know, at the bottom part of the table. Uh, changes in reserves, uh, i.e. what the central banks do are very different uh, from what the private sector and the treasury or the finance ministry does. So aggregating, uh, looking at total flows, which reflects the actions of the private sector, the government and the central bank uh, can, and if you're looking for their responsiveness to global factors, aggregating those three sectors uh, can, be, uh, can be problematic. It's, it's not as informative as if you look at what the central bank is doing separately. Um, so this two types of aggregation problems are, you know, a big takeaway. Uh, and I would highlight that one of the most surprising uh, factors uh, for us is that when you do look at aggregate flows rather than reserves, what you often see is for emerging markets, you get no significant relationship. Um, so interest rate, international interest rates go up, international interest rates go down, there's no significant relationship. Now, part of that story, as I said, and this goes back to my work, earlier work with Calvo uh, and Laterman, uh, part of that story has to do, uh, Calvo and Laterman were looking also at, at reserve accumulation and, and real exchange rates that as international interest rates go down, conditions for emerging markets improve, uh, central banks accumulate reserves. But remember, reserve accumulation is an official capital outflow uh, rather than inflow. So uh, let me now wrap up because I wanna make sure that I leave time, uh, sufficient time for uh, uh, Q&A. Um, what are some of the takeaways from the, you know, the, the panoramic picture uh, of the last 200 years? Um, and can they help us uh, um, understand anything that, that is happening? Uh, so let me just list first what I think are some of the stark differences, but some of the, 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 the parallels between what we're experiencing today, as re I'm not talking about, you know, many broad encompassing uh, economic, you know, output declines and so on. I'm talking specifically about what we've seen in, in international capital markets. Um, the most obvious uh, differences, of course, is that the current crisis started as, as, as and remains uh, a health crisis rather than the classic financial excess. Although we didn't lack bubbles and we didn't lack uh, 
surges in corporate indebtedness, in particular in the US, but more broadly, also globally. Um, the, 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 the key driver is, is, is not a financial factor, it is a health factor. Uh, that's very different. The policy response is, is completely different from anything we saw in response to the financial market collapse and the economic contraction of the 30s in both fiscal and monetary policy and both uh, in advanced economies and in much greater degree in emerging markets depending on their ability to act counter cyclically. But let me focus on the parallels, which is what I'd like to leave you with. Uh, both episodes are really global crises. The term global is often overused. Uh, the global crisis of 2008, 2009, uh, yes, it hit emerging markets in late 2008, in early 2009, but it was really an advanced economy crisis. It hit 11 economies, the US and mostly Europe. Uh, emerging markets, as I said, were hit hard in late 2008, early 2009, but had V-shaped recoveries fueled by the locomotive of Chinese growth, which was double digit at the time. So that was an advanced economy crisis 10 years ago or, 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 or 12 years ago. Uh, the 1980s was an emerging market crisis. This crisis, like the 1930s, is global, advanced, emerging, uh, middle income, low income, uh, high income, uh, very broad. Um, there are significant declines in commodity prices and the more notorious one really oil. Uh, this uh, also has historically, as I've been discussing, triggered uh, debt servicing problems and crises in many countries. And I am convinced, but I'm going there, we're, that, that we're, we're, we're on the cusp of seeing uh, the outcome of uh, the sharp reversal in flows, the uh, crashing in oil prices and other commodities. We've seen rising volatility. I showed you the chart earlier and asked you to store that in mind. Uh, and we're seeing a massive contraction in trade, which I have not integrated here, but remember we're working with a balance of payments identity. So the current account by definition includes the, the trade balance. Uh, and we're seeing you know, a massive contraction in, in, on the trade side. So the counter, counterparty of that is seeing the massive contraction in the finance side. Uh, of the BOP identity. And this, the last one is uh, one that is of great concern to me, which we have seen a wave of sovereign downgrades. Uh, they are, I will show you the data, which I track monthly from 1980 onwards, uh, they're an all time peak. Uh, this, you know, this, and we've seen these downgrades, I'm gonna show you only the sovereign, but uh, the corporates are way up there as well. This bodes ill for new defaults. Uh, so one more slide after this and I'm done. Um, th what this shows, there has been some, I would note, there has been some recovery in April from this series. This is from the International uh, um, IIF. Um, and, um, the reversal in capital flows, that sudden stop, that, that dramatic drop that you see there occurs, which is a hallmark of this crisis, occurs in six weeks. This is how sudden, this is a sudden, sudden stop. Uh, it occurs in six weeks and it took us over a year to have a magnitude, a, a decline of that magnitude uh, in, in capital flow reversals in the 2008-2009 crisis. By the way, this is, you see a picture like this, very similar with US unemployment claims. Um, the spike in US unemployment claims that we've had in you know, six, eight weeks took more than 60 weeks to get to during the 2008-2009 crisis. So this is very sudden, very abrupt. And the only comparison that I can see something of that scale that sudden uh, is more akin to uh, the interwar. Um, 
the uh, last slide that I want to show you, which is what I based my remarks on the concerns about a wave of new defaults, is what this two figures show, the, the left panel from 1990 and the right panel from 1980, is the share or the incidence of uh, downward revised outlooks for sovereigns and on the right panel, the actual downgrades in credit ratings. Uh, so, you know, I, my sense is that there is, yes, there is the siren song that interest rates in the US are zero and the search for yield, just as I described it in the early 1820s uh, for, for the UK is alive and well now. But my, so, so it's, I'm not talking about, you know, th that we're already in the midst of, of an irreparable collapse. But my sense is that with the deteriorating environment, with the high, with the weaker ratings, come higher interest debt servicing costs. Governments are, because of the COVID pandemic, it, it, many emerging markets are pushing their debts to, uh, ranges where uh, risk aversion on the part of investors becomes a very live concern. Uh, so the incidence of new defaults, um, I think, is, is a very significant risk. And with it um, comes a reversal or a continued, we've already seen the reversal, but a continued drying of capital flows. Uh, on, I, I will end on the uplifting note that I think that unfortunately these, these reversals may only be partially uh, rever you know, may, may only be partially undone even after COVID-19 uh, leaves the picture because I think we're seeing like we did in the era between the end of uh, World War I and uh, the Bretton Woods period, a tendency towards a deglobalization cycle. Uh, and so uh, I will stop here and, and uh, open the floor for questions. Uh, thank you very much, Carmen. This was a, a fantastic uh, overview. There are some uh, very interesting questions that have been forwarded to me in the Q&A. Um, I'd like, however, to take advantage of my uh, privilege as chair to be the first one to ask your question, which uh, is about what you were just talking about and your concerns about uh, the prospect of a spike in defaults and, and reversals of flows uh, in response to the uh, crisis we're experiencing. Is an implication of that concern that current attempts by many governments to try to cushion the effects of the crisis through fiscal policy is misguided and is going to do more harm than good. Uh, in other words, um, is there a risk that, a bit like what happened with the global financial crisis, uh, these fiscal expansions that many governments are trying to use now will uh, uh, be very soon seen as uh, kind of harbinger of potential defaults and, and cause sudden stops and reversals and other types of uh, very adverse uh, shocks on, on countries. So Francesco, this is, uh, uh, the, the, the question you're asking is actually a very deep one, and, but it, it's, it's, it's broader than that, it's the same, the, the same debate that's been raging about lives versus the economy, so to speak. You, you know, if, if you're a government that uh, is facing, you know, the, the, a, a pandemic of unknown duration and initially also unknown, unknown severity, um, you know, uh, is this the time to be you're talking to a very fiscally conservative person, but this I view this as a war uh, and I've characterized it as a war. Um, and what is typical during wars 
is you worry about winning the war, then you worry how you're going to pay for the war. Uh, and, and, and that's that's where we are. Uh, the problem that is tragic for many developing countries and emerging markets is that they don't even have that much time. You know, that they start seeing the adverse consequences from credit markets much more immediately. Uh, but, you know, I do view the current environment as very much akin to you know, it, how many countries said, okay, we're not going to issue debt because, you know, uh, it's going to put us in a very vulnerable position three years from now, possibly when we're occupied. Uh, I, you know, you, you, don't, you don't factor that in. And I think that's, that's, that's a relevant comparison to this. Okay, let me thank you, Carmen. Let me, let me now try to, um, try to pick some of the questions that have been passed on to me. I feel obliged to start with the Jaime uh, because he tells me that he is both an LSE alumnus and in three hours he will be an Harvard Kennedy School alumnus as well uh, because apparently today is commencement at uh, Harvard. Um, so um, Jaime asks, uh, most countries are engaged in significant monetary expansion in a world with low inflation and uh, minimal transactions. Um, what inflationary patterns do you expect? What financial products experience inflation? What it, financial it's, it's, that, that's a great topic. That, that's a great topic. And uh, I, for one, if, 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 in, in a nutshell, I think we are gonna have more inflation. Uh, and part of the, the reason I think we're gonna have more inflation, I, I, I'm not talking about the very short run. Okay, let's just talk about the immediate very short run. You have a collapse in aggregate demand. We've had a collapse in oil prices, which has repercussions, obviously, for the energy component uh, of consumer price indices across the globe. So I, I, given those two factors, the collapse in demand, the, the, the crash in energy, uh, I don't think it's around the corner. However, however, uh, the other part of the discussion we were having earlier on trade, um, this is a major supply shock. So, so COVID-19 is not just that it's generated this, this massive uh, contraction in aggregate demand. Uh, most, of course, most obvious in, in hitting this, the, 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 the service industry relating to, to international travel and tourism, but it, Supply chains, uh, the, when one tracks the high frequency data on trade, uh, one begins to get the impression that, you know, this, this shock uh, has had a massive uh, disruption on the supply side, as well as on the demand side. And, um, The 1970s was a very, very different supply ch shock. Uh, it was qu quite the opposite of what we're seeing on the energy front right now. But I think we are not yet fully attuned what some of the hysteresis effects uh, on global supply chains and potential output growth uh, and how long those effects are going to last. Uh, that's one factor. The other factor, so, so I think there's a supply story there that is far more serious than 2008, 2009, uh, in which it was a much more, not that, not that it didn't impact, uh, um, I mean, the, you know, as, as we've seen, potential output pivoted down uh, post 2008, 2009 crisis, I'm afraid that the effects this time around will be even steeper and will also involve uh, emerging markets, especially those emerging markets uh, that in, importantly depended on growth on their external uh, uh, orientation. Um, the other factor that has worried me, and I wrote a recent piece with Rob Subraman from Nomura on this, we've been talking about this for a while, is the issue of food crisis. Uh, you know, 
rel that that's a relative price change. But it's a relative price change that we're already seeing. Actually, you know, in some in some instances, it's outward food crisis means famine. This is this is what we're seeing, and actually, you know, coexisting with a COVID problem, there's a, a hunger problem, um, and and food price spikes. Uh, you know, food prices account for 40 to 60 percent for the poorest countries of their CPI. For the advanced economies, much less, but take a good look at the US CPI in recent months. Uh, overall, you know, CPI increases are, you know, importantly driven down by the decline in energy prices, the decline in retail prices, the decline in flying, but who's flying? And I would ask you who's even uh, driving a lot. Uh, but the, re the relative, but food prices have, have been, you know, increasing to the tune of over 1% uh, a month. And, and, and so, you know, I, I think that the supply story is, is, is an important complication here. And so that's, that's my inclination. And I think we will see it in emerging markets first, the spike in inflation because, uh, because of a currency crash that we, we are seeing. And I think the, the food shortages, uh, food effects have bigger, uh, more immediate weight on, on those CPIs. And also we've seen a lot of currency crashes, which even with modest pass-through will ultimately, you know, all, and I said, this is not immediate, but I think we'll ultimately uh, start kicking in uh, once aggregate demand begins to, you know, uh, stabilize more. Well, on that note, um, Carmen, there are quite a few questions that I think are broadly under the umbrella of uh, giving us a preview of the advice you will be giving as chief economist of the World Bank to uh, emerging markets and developing countries in general uh, in, in the context of the current crisis. So I just pick one of these questions, but there are quite a few. Uh, that I think are on similar lines. So Jorge Leighton, uh, who is an LSE alumnus writing from Bolivia, he asks um, what, um, from the point of view of an emerging market, uh, particularly one that is highly dependent on commodity prices and um, facing increasing twin deficits during COVID-19, which we talked about a minute ago, um, you know, essentially uh, what is your advice, not only about capital flows, but macroeconomic, macroeconomic policy. I, mean, I know you said something along those lines already when we talk about fiscal policy. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe there is also some other aspects that uh, exchange rate policy or capital flow policy. Right. Or capital flow policy. So, so look, uh, um, it, the, the decisions are extremely difficult because, you know, of the constraints. The constraints vary enormously. Uh, country by country, but it also initial conditions uh, vary a lot country by country. Uh, for example, in the case of Bolivia, that's the, you know, the, the, the idea of exchange rate fixity uh, at a moment in which uh, inflows of capital are down because commodity prices are down, inflows of capital are down because tourism is down, uh, because export volumes more generally. Uh, so inflows of foreign exchange are really hard hit by this crisis. Uh, one has to ask the question, do you really want to use existing reserves to support the exchange rate or do you want to use uh, reserves to import necessities? I mean, that that's, um, I think, um, you know, uh, rethinking the, uh, rethinking, you know, exchange rate policy in the, in, in the tug of war between, do you really want to use your reserves, uh, in, in a moment where, where there's a scarcity for anything other than, than, than necessities? I think that's, uh, a big consideration. I think another big consideration um, is, uh, you know, for example, the, I've been surprised to some degree by the low take 
of many low income countries, IDA countries, uh, to go along with the G20 uh, debt moratorium. Um, you know, and a recurring voiced concern is that, uh, look, if we go along, even though this is, you know, been offered by the G20, uh, if we go along and participate in the moratorium, we're going to be downgraded by credit rating agencies. Uh, I understand the concern. However, let me say this. I think the odds of getting downgraded by the credit ratings are there well before participation. Uh, I think they're predicated on uh, the expectations about growth rates, uh, the, the prior payment of uh, you know, the, the path of, of debt repayments, um, you know, commodity market developments. There, so, so I don't view the connection. I, I don't view saying we're not going to participate in, 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 in the debt relief initiative because we're worried about credit ratings. I think that those concerns, I understand the concern, but I don't find that compelling. So I, I think given that we started with this, with a health emergency, and this also connects to my remarks about using reserves, uh, it's countries uh, that especially have a tough time accessing capital markets do well. This is the time to, to go to the IMF, go to the World Bank, you know, go to the multilaterals, participate in debt to, to get some support on very concessional terms to deal with what started as a health emergency. This is, you know, this is not your classic moral hazard, you know, um, uh, you know, financial crisis story, although in many countries, the problems predate COVID um, on the international front. Carmen, just as a follow up on your answer, I noticed and um, also Hazel Park on Santos or Hazel Santos from Philippines notices that you have not mentioned capital controls in your answer. Um, and I wanted to get you to say it explicitly what you really think about that. So look, I have, I have had a very open view on capital controls for many, many years. In effect, if you go back to some of my work in the mid 1990s, uh, it was basically saying it was very amenable, but they're capital controls and they're capital controls. And let me be very explicit. During the booms, when you, know, when you are the darling of the financial community, uh, I have argued that you know there's a whole range of you know whether you call them whether you're calling them macroprudential tools or you call them capital controls or they're really a blend of the two things that are very useful uh, in terms of limiting the volatility. Now comes the point of what happens when the problem, as is obviously not the case now, are inflows but outflows. Um, so capital, you do capital controls because they buy you time. That's, that's what they do. Um, one of the differences between imposing controls on inflows and imposing controls on outflows is signaling, okay? In the putting controls on inflows, I don't think you really have to worry about adverse signaling in terms of Oh, you're being prudential. You know, you're you're trying to avoid hot money. You're uh, in the midst of a crisis. Uh, it, it does send a signal that you're you're you know a lot closer to desperation, and that's my uh, uh, misgiving. But misgiving in the sense not sufficiently to say I would not. No, no, my misgiving in using it as a standard first line of defense uh, uh, policy. I do think I've written a lot on financial repression, okay? 
And I do think that part of this financial repression story, which in the advanced economies has also been called macroprudential, is you get the domestic banks, you get the pen domestic pension funds uh, to buy more of the government debt that is being issued to finance uh, uh, the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. Now that, um, you know, is not exactly a capital control, but it is a way of increasing the, the base, the demand for uh, um, um, increasing the demand for, for debt. But in the end, my sense is if, and this is a big if, we don't know how long this will last. If this persists, if uh, countries really are hit uh, on a more sustained basis, um, then the issue of, of, of capital controls, uh, you know, becomes a more integral part of the, uh, of the policy response. I think it has to do a lot with the persistence of the shock. Uh, and one also has to recognize that the, 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 the callers from the Philippines, but you know, there are other factors that are hitting capital flows that I haven't even touched on here. And these are capital flows through the current account, which is remittances. And like for, for the Philippines, that's a particularly uh, important element. So it's big shocks may require, uh, you know, a more uh, out of the box, more hetero, you know, heterodox policy response. I'm, I'm okay with that, but I, I wouldn't be my first line of defense. Okay, thanks, Carmen. Um, a bit of a changing topic. There were a few uh, participants interested specifically on some of the comments you made on um, China and Chinese um, capital flows. Uh, so, for example, Rodi Lee, who is a LSE student in the IPE program, uh, says um, uh, whether um, you see implications from your analysis for change or continuity in the capital flow pattern between the US and China uh, and global imbalances more generally. So, uh, yeah, I mean, we're, we're uh, we're living through 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 a period uh, where you know major shocks seem to be uh, you know cropping up uh, from multiple sources. Uh, you know we've of course been talking about in the latter part of my 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 pre presentation about COVID, but another major shock we've had. Uh, this year is the Russian Saudi oil war, and now the reheating of the US China uh, trade war. Um, and, you know, I, I think this goes back, I'm trying to bring it back to, to the analysis that I've done uh, with uh, Vincent and Christoph in this paper. Uh, I, I think what a result that that is likely to bring is also more risk aversion. Uh, and more risk aversion, um, you know, when you're talking about uh, emerging markets as a whole, uh, it means more likely to be risk off and risk off. Uh, you know, means l lower flows. Um, but I, I want to say something about uh, the the work on Chinese lending. Um, my sense is that the peak in lending, in that lending boom, uh, was also behind even without a trade war. Okay, even without a trade war, I think the big surge in lending that we documented, that slide that I included, which is from, from uh, our 
recent uh, uh, NBR working paper, um, that that has peaked for the following reasons. One is um, in the uh, VAR analysis that we did on drivers of China's outflows consistently, and this was irrespective of the uh, specification used, is pretty robust that China's growth rate was a big push factor for uh, flows from China. It, you know, to the extent we already had, you know, 2003, 2013, Chinese growth was on average more than 10%. It ratcheted down to six. Now we're not going to, you know, have guidelines, understandably, because any predicting anything with any kind of precision in this, in, in, in this environment where we don't know whether we're going to have a second wave or you know, how long the first wave will take to circle the globe and so on uh, is, is, you know, led the, the Chinese authorities to, you know, stay away from, from, uh, from explicit targets. So, I, I, but I my expectation is that that six is going to ratchet down again. Uh, so that one big push factor is, mm, you know, not a driver in the same way it was in those years when capital flows to a lot of the low income countries were surging. The other part is not a push factor, but it's a pull factor. One of the things that made so many low income countries such an attractive investment destination for China was these countries also had just gone through the HIPIC initiative, the highly indebted poorest country uh, debt initiative meant that a lot of the external debts were written off. So these countries at that time in the early 2000s, not so much, but later as 2000 progressed and the HIPIC initiative, uh, uh, you know, um, changed appreciably their, their external indebtedness profile, they looked like really very attractive, you know, if you had a relatively clean balance sheet, very little external debt after, you know, the HIPAA initiative. And uh, uh, that's not the case now. Uh, one of the reasons we, we were discussing earlier is the, uh, the odds of a new wave of defaults um, has a huge, huge uh, component coming from COVID uh, shocks and, and the fiscal problems that COVID shocks have has created, but for many countries, for a good many countries, the vulnerabilities were there uh, before COVID. Uh, so even before COVID, I was expecting, you know, a slowdown on Chinese lending. And of course, you know, uh, I, I, I really don't know what the financial land landscape would look at if the current tensions, you know, between China and the U.S. Uh, uh, end up with, you know, two two global blocks. I really, but in the more likely case where the tensions remain but they don't escalate, um, I would still expect, you know, a slowdown in, in flows. I regret to say that uh, our time is up and um, I say it with, with regret because I, I've been looking at uh, some of the questions that they didn't have time to ask and there are many, many great ones. So I, I'm really sorry we didn't get to them, but uh, unfortunately we're out of time. So apologies for that. And um, what is left is to uh, thank Carmen for a, a great lecture, great answers to the questions. Um, and we really look forward to the paper when it will come up in Economica. Thank you very much, Carmen. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for everybody for participating and for the many great questions. Thank you.